And it's my deep, quick pleasure to welcome everyone to this intern fireside chat. Thank you for being here and for sharing your experience, your ideas, your thoughts, your hesitations, perhaps. We all have that. And uh, with us and with each other, I want to particularly thank our guests from New York City Health and Hospitals, uh, Dr. Pagan and Dr. Sinias, and uh, from our medical school, uh, Vice Dean Nunes. Uh, I would like to recognize that uh, at the start of the pandemic, we were, some of you know that I'm in charge of the healthcare system. I co-chaired the, uh, it's called M Health Fairview. And uh, I still remember how deeply grateful we were for the uh, experience that was coming to us from our colleagues in New York, especially in New York City. And uh, the way that you set the example of information sharing and leadership and service, uh, we all depended on. So thank you for the tremendous work that you have done then. And of course, tonight is the special opportunity for the interns and for all of us, our guests, too, to share their knowledge and experience with the leaders of tomorrow, our interns, and bringing the new knowledge from different angles, from different viewpoints, uh, amidst uh, where the knowledge really happens, which is not in anybody's single brain, certainly not mine, but in the middle, in the middle of the table that we uh, sort of virtually sit around, as we look at the postage stamps that we are uh, these days on the on the screens. So the interaction that we will have, the questions, I still remember fondly the, the last time where we met and the questions makes us better, stronger, better versions of ourselves. And, uh, and uh, so I again would like to thank you all for joining us today and participating this evening. And now I would like to bring this to AVP Porter, who is today's moderator. Carolyn. Thank you, Vice President Toller, and thank you all for joining us tonight for this fireside chat. I'm Carolyn Porta. I'm an Associate Vice President here in the Office of Academic Clinical Affairs, and I'm also a professor in nursing. Tonight, I have the pleasure of having uh, three guests with us, and I'll ask them to briefly introduce themselves and say a few words about who they are and, and what they do in their current roles. I'll start with Dr. Natalia Sinias. Good evening, everyone. I'm Natalia Sinias. I serve as the Senior Vice President, Chief Nurse Executive at New York City Health and Hospitals, the largest public health system in the United States, where I oversee nursing, respiratory therapy, and social work services. Uh, within my scope, is providing uh, planning, staffing, and professional development for over 9,600 nurses, approximately 870 social workers, and about uh, 400 respiratory therapists. And so I look forward to tonight's discussion, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Jose Pagan. Thank you so much for the, for the invitation. My name is Jose Pagan. I'm professor and chair of the Department of Public Health Policy and Management at NYU. We have a School of Global Public Health. And then on my, my spare time, I chair the board for New York City Health and Hospitals. And uh, uh, has been quite an experience before the pandemic and then the pandemic hits and it became an even bigger experience. So I'll, I'll share with you some stories connected to that. Very Thank nice. you. And perhaps before VP Toller has to go, we'll have a brief discussion about board chair roles and uh, nursing leadership and management of the enterprise itself. Uh, before that, Dr. Anya Nunez, would you introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here to meet you. I sort of clicked on all your pictures to see the good stuff that you were doing. So there's many of you that I want to talk more with later. Um, I'm also delighted to have some of my formerly coastal colleagues. I came from Philly about 19 months ago. Um, during the pandemic, I was crazy, yes, um, but sort of a good move to wonderful people. So, but looking forward in terms of sort of um, having the energy and discussion. My background by training, I'm a general internist with um, specialties in medical education, health services, research and health policy. Um, and I here, um, after sort of a number of different leadership roles um, and engagement in lots of different spaces, 
Um, I'm the inaugural vice dean for the medical school in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and in our CTSI space serve as an integration strategist. Um, so working in terms of structural transformation, um, previous a lot of work in sex and gender medicine and women's health. Thank you, Anna. I'll remind the interns that we have the chat if you'd like to put some questions and the interns have sent some questions ahead of time. They often want to know uh, really how you as leaders have handled the pandemic. This is often a hot topic, but, but really diving more specifically, we might ask you, is there something you've learned about yourself as a human being uh, in this, in this um, pandemic and overcoming challenges? And I'll go to you, VP Toller, and perhaps you'll want to um, pose any additional comment or questions with our, with our guests before you're, you're off and running. You are very, very kind. Hey, VP Porter, I, uh, I look at this uh, from, as we all do, I think, and uh, I will be very, very interested in what Jose and Natalia have to say about how they reacted to it. Um, it's, a, it's actually much less glamorous than it may seem um, on a personal level. Uh, I eat less and exercise more. Uh, Dean Nunez knows that. Uh, and uh, on a professional level, I try to always look at this as a, who is on the receiving end of what we do. I'm of the mind that, uh, that a PowerPoint or uh, even a white paper, it's never helped anyone until you transform it, until you crystallize it in some plan ready to execution and then engaging the people that can actually do it, which is typically not me, and, uh, and, uh, and get it into the service of somebody who needs it. And um, if there is a one thing that I do is I try to quietly do it every moment of my life, actually, personally, professionally, to do the next most necessary thing. That's it. I just, just figure out, you know, what is it that the next most necessary thing is, and I get it done. I'd like to hear Jose and Natalia now. If I may, I don't want to impinge on your master of ceremonies role <laughs> here. You, here. <laughs> Go for it, Jose and then Natalia. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you for, um, it's always good to keep in mind. What is it? I think about that in terms of like, why would I do today if it was the last day in my life? And which is a similar approach to putting urgency on what's most important at that, at that moment, except I had a more morbid example, but, uh, um, um, I, you know, the pandemic, the pandemic was at first something that when you take a role but on the school side, you know, it's we have grown a whole lot, so it, the impact has been mostly how do we scale. But at, at a place like H and H, as we call it, health and hospitals, the challenge has been uh, you you walk into a role. I walked at the beginning of 2019, thinking that you're gonna be this, you're gonna be involved in decisions about staffing and purchasing and things like that, and then this thing hits you, and it's just intense, um, and. Uh, but you know, we weather it. I mean, I'm, I'm summarizing a year of like very compli complicated uh, uh, experiences where I lost a patch of my hair here and all of that happened, but it grew back. Um, but more than anything, um, one thing that it made clear is the importance of equity and how equity became, it has been central in our system, but as a board, we have made sure that that becomes like a key component of what we do and how we integrate that. And I'm bringing that up because Natalia has been critical to that with the equity, equity it's called Equity and Access Council, right? And, and basically we have gone from just talking about it to actually making it central to every activity that we do. And I, I can tell you more about it on how we did that. Um, but uh, um, and then at the personal level, Many times you have decisions you have to make that are critically important that you know are the right decisions to make. 
and you don't make them because you're just sort of like chicken out. Mm. And I've learned over time to, I wish I could figure out a way to teach this, but it's like, how do I, when I read a room and I know that a decision has to be made, wow. I think many people freeze and don't make them. And maybe because I'm having to make many high stakes decision now, I've learned to just do it. <laughs> and, and, uh, but I want to figure out how to teach that in some ways. Mm. That's one of my priorities for the next few years, by the way. Mm. Uh, and it's glad to see Dr. Nunez. I met Dr. Nunez actually right before the pandemic. She was getting an award in New York. So it's great to see you here. Thanks, Jose. Natalia. Wow, I'm blown away by the responses before my response and because it touches on my response. So just so everyone understands, I was hired and appointed March, 2019. I'm going back to the previous response of making the best of every day and really being in the moment and the power of now. Literally the entire year of 2019, I was making critical decisions to become a system within nursing. And that is executing a new strategic plan for nursing. And if I had not done that, by 2020 of March, when we received um, all of the calls, and I received that call, I'll never forget that call, one of the critical care attendings called me and said, you know, we just heard from Italy what's going on, and we need to be prepared, we need you to isolate, don't go out, if you go down, the system goes down, stay home, and I started running the system from my living room, and, you know, so it's really important to go with your gut, to Dr. Pagan's point, every decision I made before that point impacted my leadership and my team in the year of 2020. So, uh, you know, from that point on, uh, we made critical decisions to deploy uh, over 5,000 nurses. All of the relationships that I had, you know, built with the academic setting really helped us for the pandemic. And we were able to deploy education of over 10,000 nurses. So all of our 9,000 and all of the agency staff because of the amazing educators I had hired in my team had really put together the amazing curriculum. So making the best of every day, being in the moment, going with your gut, strategizing was instrumental, I would say, in our success and, and leaning on and building relationships. Personally, it was very hard. Uh, being a daughter of Haitian immigrants and losing my uncle during the pandemic was very hard. So I was running our chief nursing officer council and I got the call. It was actually a text message from my sister that said my uncle had passed and I paused and I said, everyone, I need to take a moment. And I was in shock. So I think, you know, being a black woman, you know, and, you know, being impacted personally while running the largest public health system professionally was very challenging. Um, and so with the support of amazing staff and amazing team, and family, you know, I made it through. And since then I've lost two uncles. So it's been very hard. Um, this March next month makes three years, two of which have been during the pandemic, um, but I continue to persevere and to remain resilient and to really execute a change. Going back to the equity point, um, I think COVID has highlighted that. And I'm fortunate to be within a system where the mission has been dealing with inequities, you know, since the since the beginning of time. And so now my charge is to make sure that every nurse who becomes a public health nurse understands the importance of that as we live through a public health crisis. And so that's really looking at the care we're providing as nurses and making sure that every nurse that walks through our doors understands the impact that they make on patient lives. But I'm happy to engage in the conversation this evening, but it was very, very hard. Very much, Natalia, and I'm sorry. And I know there are others on the screen that have lost loved ones. And I, I appreciate your vulnerability and transparency and willingness to share. Um, Anna, is there anything you'd want to add at this point? Well, you know, I think that, you know, some of the things I've heard was sort of the, the courage to do in the face of lots of adversity and to sort of move forward. Um, you know, I. I was looking for wonderful opportunities for a place for the next in terms of my career. Uh, I met some fabulous people here in Minnesota um, and then moved from Philadelphia to Minnesota 
um, for which many of my colleagues said, what are you crazy? <laughs> like, you know, um, in the midst of sort of a pandemic, you're actually moving. And I said, eh, I'm from Philly, I don't scare easy. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that hearing about sort of taking time for reflection, having sort of that courage, um, those are all elements of leadership in terms of sort of moving forward um, that I think are really just important to sort of highlight. Um, I also think that there is sort of something about sort of this COVID space that is this in-between space. We like being one place and arriving at another place. That feels good. And in many times of your collective careers, you're, you finished one thing and you're in transition. And that in transition feels weird, right? Um, I would share that sort of the COVID pandemic has kept us in this suspended animation of in transition for a really long time. Um, so figuring out how do we do self-care, how do we manage that in transition, not just ignore it and say, come on, let me just keep running and get on the other side of it. How do we be in there? Um, I think that's some of the challenges that we need to sort of face as well as sort of need to lead through um, in terms of sort of COVID. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, I want to come back to health equity. It's a question and a passion for many of the of the interns and the people that will listen to this conversation. But I also want to focus on what you said at the very end there with respect to self care. And I wonder, as part of going through this, you've all made choices on how you take care of yourselves, either proactively or reactively when you realize you're not taking care of yourselves. Any reflections or observations on self care. And then a tag on to that is, where are you finding some joy these days? We'll um, uh, operationalize Brene Brown a little bit here. And anyone can uh, go ahead and respond. Sure. So I will start. I will say I, my Peloton has gotten a lot of use. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of stars and badges and I'm really proud of that. <clears throat> you know, my team knows that I'm, I'm really big on self-care. I think during the pandemic, you know, we ensured that our nurses receive uh, the option of anonymous counseling, which has been fantastic. During the peak of the pandemic, we saw the use of respite rooms of over 30,000 visits um, in the peak of the pandemic. That's how much people needed a break. And that's something that we continue. In the middle of the pandemic and right after, we also started nurse leader retreats around wellness, well-being, because we understand to really take on the charge of dealing with the inequities that leaders must ensure that they're taking care of themselves. So whether it's uh, reading books, whether it's um, you know executing a national plan your vacation day, which our CEO just messaged out to the entire leadership team, uh, mm -hmm. we've made it a point in nursing to ensure that we are retreating, we are taking time to reflect, and we are ensuring that our staff have the support they need to also reflect and recharge, such as even taking a day off to, to decompress. You know, I wanna follow up on that very briefly. We're hearing a lot, if anyone's paying attention to some of the Twitter world right now, and it's not just in nursing, but talking about resiliency and putting the responsibility on the, on the person, on the frontline worker. What I'm hearing from you is, the responsibility of the leaders to role model, the leaders to give space for people to, to take care of themselves. And this is a, a room full of a screen full of future leaders learning from some of you. I would love to hear a little bit more about that as well. Um, perhaps just following up, Natalia, how do you as a system leader role model in a way that operationalizes such that the frontline worker doesn't feel um, intimidated or unable to make use of, of resources, but also doesn't just feel like it's on them to fix themselves when there might be a system problem. Right. I think, I think as leaders, we have to realize that there's a lot of power in your position. And I think we have to normalize taking a break. We have to normalize, where did you go on vacation? We have to normalize those icebreakers that allow individuals to talk about their last vacation and when they last have a good time and that's okay and then you get back to business. But I think it's important that uh, we create healthy work environments that are really centered around balance and ensuring that we're connecting on that level. And that's new for us, but, but it's part of what we do now. You know, I most recently had an icebreaker of, you know, where do you commute from? Something as simple as that led to Brene Brown's empathy of, oh my God, you take two buses and a train to get here. 
and we're empathizing, right? But but little things like that allow us to connect with one another. Where did you go on your last vacation? Where did you go on a ski trip? Uh, and it's important because it's important that as a leader, I'm demonstrating it's okay to take care of uh, yourself and it's okay to take vacation. I work really hard. And during the pandemic, I work 19 hour days, but I don't wanna make that the norm for my team, right? It's important that everyone understands that in order to be your best self, you have to be recharged. I love that. Thank you, Natalia. Jose or Jacob or Anna? I love that this whole issue of wellness to me is, is fascinating because it, we tend to, the easy solutions is to tell folks, you know, go for a walk or do something <laughs> that makes you feel better. And I think as, especially in, in, in the role, of, in a governance role in a health system like that, one of the things that I do but that may not be evident is I pay attention to the frustrations that I see with, with the leadership and staff and so on. And some of those frustrations are connected to processes in the system that may drive people crazy. One could be like the, the typical one is electronic health records, but you could think about any other process like that. And then what you try to do is like, how can I make the life of our nurses, our doctors, our physicians, our staff, better uh, and it's a combination of making their work easier and they also because it's very mission driven you're dealing with basically a safety net system people are our providers care about our patients a whole lot you know and they're connected in the same community so how do you then figure out how to address those needs so do you provide the appropriate level of translation services do you have facilities that are that are inviting and, and pay respect or are respectful to, and, and, and do everybody get equal treatment. So, but you can do it in a way that as board chair you can, or with a board, you, you have a lot of say on these things because you basically give a message and say, here's what we're gonna do in this area. You don't, do, you don't implement it, but you, you guide that. Um, and then I like to run. I run personally. I, if, I, if I feel like, Anything is achy is because I did it too much. <laughs> but a few days, if I can go to South Texas and go fishing and just spend time by the beach, I like that too. Thank you. Jacob or Anna, any comments? I want to mention uh, something that actually um, Jacob did, which I thought was really powerful. Um, you know, he'd heard about during sort of the pandemic, everybody was getting crushed by emails because they wanted to communicate. They wanted to let people know there was just everything happening. And you know, when a million different people from a million different places start blowing up your email, um, that doesn't help your vitality. Uh, right? um, and he actually in a very coordinated way sort of asked senior leaders to cut it out. Um, you know, that, you know, do you really need, you know, as soon as something comes in your head, another email too, you know, can it be clumped? Can it be curated in a way um, to decrease sort of that important stuff, but yet noise that really wasn't helping sort of people sort of doing the pandemic. Um, I thought it was pretty brilliant um, and hard to do and certainly hard to maintain, right? Because after sort of, we were sort of very making the point of this, we sort of backed off a little bit and it kind of, you know, mitotically grew again, um, you know, but I, so I think that that is an important thing that we as leaders want to communicate, love to communicate, encourage people to communicate, but also need to figure out how do we not communicate? How do we amplify appropriately so that we don't sort of contribute to the fatigue, you know? too much love and maybe that's a problem, you know, that we have to sort of balance that in terms of sort of that communication. So I, I thought actually that was a really lovely thing. I don't run, I have bad knees, okay? So, you know, I, I do the biking thing once in a while and I sort of say to myself, I should exercise more. So I feel like a, a meat lump with these other three. So, um, but you know, uh, the weather will change and, and biking will be an option. So there, there's hope for me, I think. Thank you. I learned from Dr. Nunez, the most brilliant thing, which is you stop. You stop and watch the bald eagle, the jill, so, you know, above your, or you stop and do something borderline silly, like Dr. Nunez. It's not silly. I don't, I'm not judging it, but, but it was funny, you know, because she's funny. And she made these lanterns that are beautiful. They are frozen lanterns. And from somebody who has not 
been here for decades like myself, you know, it's sort of an unusual thing, you know, that you fill in the balloon, you know, with water and, and you have a frozen lantern, you know, so, so that, that not, you know, I, I, I'm sort of, you know, projecting, I apologize, Anna, if that's inappropriate, but, you know, sort of make fun of oneself, you know, it's really important. And uh, I think that uh, there's not a better word than, uh, than luminosity, you know, the luminosity of the moment, you know, whatever that is, you know, that ability to see the unity in what we do, to stay silent, you know, just, just, you know, the email silence is a part of it, but also to, just to be silent and look, you know, inside who is that neglected stranger that is me uh, has been, has been quite liberating. Because I am, you know, just for the full disclosure, I'm not a vacationing type. I'm, 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 you know, I, my family makes fun of me, you know, because they are on the beach. I read my books, you know, in the, you know, on the dunes, you know, if I have to go. And I, I take care of everything and, and whatever. But I'm just not that, that um, uh, you know, we all relax in a different way. I, I relax with books. I relax with opera. I relax with people, uh, with my family, with my children and grandchild. And uh, so, so everybody's different, you know, and I have, uh, and I, perhaps this group can be, you know, of some help, some guidance, you know, to us, because I always looked with some disbelief, to say the least, you know, at these well-being tips. If you do these seven things, you know, you're going to be, I, I don't think so. You know, I, I, I just, I, I, you know, I, I distinguish, and this is the last thing that I'm going to say, and then, you know, stop being boring. Uh, I think there's a difference between well-being that's hedonic, you know, that's, that's, you know, sort of a, you know, let's get some, a little fix, you know, dope. I mean, nothing against it. I enjoy, you know, a good glass of, I enjoy a glass of good wine, I should say, you know, as anyone, you know, and uh, occasionally. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm, what I'm identifying with, what ancients called eudaimonic, Eudaimonia means flourishing or becoming who you are. Becoming, you know, you are here, your potential is here. How do you get over here, right? So that 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 eudaimonic well-being is is closer to what my teams, I think, identify with. Back to you. Thank you, Jacob. And thank you all. I, it's fun to listen to you all. And then I have to go back to some of the beginning because maybe you have some reactions to what's, what's just been said as well. Um, anything from you at this point, Natalia or Jose um, or Anna, just in, in feedback and response? Just two points for nursing, particularly and just our system at New York City Health and Hospitals. Uh, what we realized post wave one of the pandemic was the need to have a chief wellness officer. And I'm very proud of our system for appointing a chief wellness officer. Um, because again, it's important to normalize wellness and to assist staff in the best way possible and to provide that 24 seven uh, wellness program. We have to realize that hospitals are 24 seven. And so night shift requires support, et cetera. Um, and our chief wellness officer has done a fantastic job. The other thing that we are rolling out uh, this year in nursing is our care delivery model, which focuses on Dr. Jean Watson, uh, the human caring theory. And so what we will do is ensure at the beginning of every shift, and a lot of hospital systems are doing this now, is that we implement her caritas, whether that's breathing, mindfulness at the beginning of the shift and to just pause and to take in that moment. Um, and so I'm really uh, excited about integrating uh, those caritas within the environment of the patient care units, which are very busy, very stressful, and just taking time to really be in the moment of the care that we will provide to think that patients are on units and uh, you know they're really living on these patient care units. And so we wanna ensure that our staff are you know, in one sound mind before entering that patient care uh, setting. And so I'm really excited about rolling this out this year. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, I'm going to look to Hannah. Where's Hannah? She's one of our, our interns, physical therapy um, intern, and she has a question for the group. Yeah, so you guys kind of touched on equity throughout um, the pandemic being the big issue. So building off of that, could you, um, if you could do one thing to improve a person's health, 
um, or just people's health in general or their access to healthcare, um, what would it be? Um, and why hasn't it been tried already? You said for one person or for the system, for a group? Uh, the system or people in general. Yeah, to, to, to achieve equity. Um, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention how, how I think we did this and, and how to message it. One of the things that most systems or anyone, any of us, uh, have difficulty with this, how do you keep a consistent message going? So let's say that you care about equity in a system, then you may say, well, I include that in, in my mission statement and so on, and, and, and that's good. But what I've noticed is that if you make it central to the activities that you do and you keep a consistent message on that, then, then things, things happen, improvement happen, because everybody knows that that's a priority for a, for a system at the system level. And I think, I really think that's the way we have been able to do that because it's consistent across every line of business, if you want to call it that way, or every activity that we do. And I think many systems struggle with that. Um, and also the fear, the fear of like, you know, um, am I uncovering something that I should have done something about, and now I have to do something about it, not, not having a plan on what to do about the issue. I went to system level there, but you know. Yeah, I think that's good, Jose, and I'm just going to follow up on it. So uh, you are a health economist. We didn't necessarily say that at the beginning you might have. So you do look at outcomes that are maybe different than other professions look at outcomes, or a nurse might look at an individual level outcome, and you, you've often looked at system level. Is what you're doing working? Are you achieving equity? I, I don't know if, if you can look at outcomes and say we, we're doing it a certain way, you know, I mean, I think what we are trying to do at this stage is how do we create an environment so that we can reach that by saying, okay, social and racial equity, for example, are central to the system. And then every activity that we do are connected to us. So for example, uh, when we do contracting, we have gone from like 4% uh, uh, of our contracts going to minority women owned business to like 28% in like three years. And that's basically the way I think about it is like, these are jobs and activities that stay in the, in the neighborhoods where we, where we uh, uh, operate or work. Um, and it's aligned with our mission. And just like that, we try to do that in every single area. So for example, whether it's clinical, like how do you um, slice the data so that you can look at uh, health outcomes across ethnic and racial groups. So right now we're doing, we didn't have systems on how to do some of that. So what we do is we set a target and say, can we at least slice the data that way? And then that means that next time, then that becomes sort of a goal. Natalia may have some better examples than that on it or, or how she perceives it when we communicate it, right? Absolutely. Um... So Hannah, I would say it's a comprehensive approach. And I think what we've done, what uh, Dr. Pagan as you know, president of the board has done a fantastic job in sure, first of all, making sure that social and racial equity is the foundation of everything that we do within our strategic pillars. So we changed everything and we made that the focus. And to Dr. Pagan's point is integrating equity into everything, the way we communicate into our dashboards, into technology, and so what we did is, you know, as we're changing the platform of our technology, creating dashboards, building a new electronic medical record, ensuring that the metrics of equity are monitored. And that's exactly what Dr. Pagan was just describing, looking at uh, the labs that our physicians ordered. You know, why are they ordering labs for that patient and being cognizant of that, thinking of the fact that we care for patients in over 180 languages, right? What is the language of the written discharge instructions. Are they able to read it? So really being cognizant that this is multifactorial and a huge endeavor. And so right now we have multiple balls in the air to capture the inequities uh, and making sure that we are tactical and strategic about our approach. 
Uh, within nursing, it's really interesting, right? If you think about the future of nursing report, uh, the 2020-2030 report, the national agenda for nursing is focusing on health equity. I sat back with my team and I thought, how are the bedside nurses impacting equity? And everyone was just apoplectic. Like, what are we doing for the bedside nurse? Right. And so what we're doing now is ensuring that every bedside nurse understands the discharge plan and our inequities embedded within that discharge plan. Is the patient able to go to the pharmacy? You know, does the patient have transport to go to dialysis? The little things, does the patient have keys? How will the patient, you know, receive groceries if they're in a fourth floor walk up in New York City? So we're thinking about it in a multi pronged approach to tackle it in many different ways. I'm also proud of a new endeavor that we have uh, with um, CUNY where we are tackling the future of nursing report in every element to make sure the technology, to make sure the clinical care is all really focused on inequities and building uh, equity and also educating leaders around social determinants of health. I think we use the term equity and we think everyone really understands what that means. Right? And so we're doing a lot of education. We just kicked off our first program where someone came and talked about culture, diversity, inclusion. And so right now we're actually looking to hire more Caucasian nurses because that is ensuring that the care that we're providing is also equitable. So again, it's multifactorial. As co-chair of the Equity and Access Council, we're looking at labs, we're looking at technology, we're looking at inclusion groups, uh, where we have a lot of participation and everyone's really excited that this Equity and Access Council has started. And I will say, we started this work, um, you know, in the middle of the social unrest that we saw among the world, uh, you know, during the pandemic. And the beauty with health and hospitals is allowing our staff to say what they want to say and for us to support them in what they want to do. So these inclusion groups are focused on everything. Um, on all, all, all cultures and to ensure that everyone has a voice. But Hannah, you know, I think you ask an important question. Why wasn't it done before? You know, we will never know. Um, all we do know is that right now uh, we have an executive team that's committed to making a difference. Everything that, every program that we're running has metrics to see if we're moving the needle on uh, making sure that you know we are providing care that is equitable, but it's a huge endeavor. It's an exciting journey, and I don't think um, there's a better time to do it than now because of what we just saw with the pandemic. I'm gonna try to answer what Natalia just said. Why did we do it before without? Because I think we had great, a great structure, and I know many of the people that were there before we were there. But I, I really think part of it is. There's a lot of diversity of opinions and backgrounds on the board and trust. And, and that translates also to the way our CEO operates and how who, who we have sort of like put together in, the, in a leadership role. And that sort of like filters to the whole organization in many ways so that um, um, the focus tends to be then on okay if 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 equity is important to us then then so we sort of like set an expectation and norms that that's what's important and and uh, and uh, um, having very competent people is very important even if they're in different fields doing certain jobs because it means you will be asked difficult questions that you were not thinking about before uh, especially in large systems that things get to be there's a certain inertia to how things happen. So having a smart person that says, why haven't you thought about using buildings to how, uh, you know, to put a build, using space to put a building and, 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 and put housing there, you know, or, uh, well, because of regulation, usually it's a regulation, I'm saying, you know, that cannot be done. <laughs> Then having a group, a, a group of people that can talk to each other and say, let's figure it out from both the management side and the governance side, then makes it, speeds it up a little bit. So. So I had add, Heather, that <clears throat> part of it, it, the systems weren't built for equity, right? I mean, health insurance in the United States started because you had these things called hospitals who wanted to get paid. 
and you had physicians groups who wanted to get paid. And they said, hmm, how do we make sure we get paid? Okay, we'll only insure people who work have jobs so that they can pay us. And that became sort of insurance, which is why we're the only developed country that when you lose your job, you lose your insurance, which when you think about it is remarkably silly because don't you want people to be healthy enough to get another job? Right? But we don't do that in the US because the system wasn't built. Um, so I think that that's number one. It was it was built for return on investment. It was built on sort of sort of you know business principles that the people and their outcomes um, weren't necessarily the focus. And and over time, with lots of push, it became sort of more so. Um, but I think the the other thing that that's really important, and as you listen in terms of Jose and Natalia, is actually the importance in terms of representation. In a, in a group of people, if there's one person of a particular group, that person doesn't get hurt, they get drowned out. And generally it's about a third of the group of people like that people, women, underrepresented minorities, whomever you want, you need some, some folks around the table so the voice gets heard and the voice gets amplified. And when you have that representation, a couple of magical things happen. They come up with crazy ideas like, hey, instead of just having people who have COVID within our hospital, what if we have a hospital for it and do something like that? Can we do that? And so they come up with these crazy ideas. Some things can work, some things can't, but that innovation happens because you have that representation. And that's really important in terms of investing, of having those voices. These aren't cyborgs. These aren't everybody who says the same thing, you know, and everybody goes marching around like those white guys in sort of, you know, Star Wars or whatever, right? I mean, these are people that kind of irritate you because they come up with these crazy ideas. It isn't how we usually do it. And that in terms of disruptive innovation is where you get sort of those big ideas, but you have to recruit those people. You have to want them on the team and you need to support them you know, when they lock horns with the people who do sort of, you know, the tradition, we always do it this way, right? You have to support them in terms of sort of figuring out sort of some solutions to move it forward. So we haven't done it with this way because health equity wasn't how it was built. And we have, you know, tons and tons of years of how we do it that as Natalia sort of talked about to interrogate these, you have to get really deep, you know, with our joint clinical enterprise and the Hope Commission, uh, they're going through the weeds as well in terms of all these different pieces because there are so many layers of complexity and rules and processes that you really to take that equity lens is more than a full-time job. So to really unearth the existing, I mean, it, it would be easier if it didn't exist and we were making it anew in terms of saying, okay, we're going to start with equity and this is how we're going to grow it. But we're actually taking sort of, you know, a, a hundred story skyscraper and trying to rehab the whole thing to the focus to be about sort of equity. And so there's some of the, the work that you're hearing here and the structural transformation that we're trying to do here in the medical school, um, that's, that's where the hard work is. I mean, in my lifetime, when I was a medical student, I did a project and to find out about sort of representation, and this is back in Philadelphia. And so I looked in terms of how did they know who people were based on their self-identification? And I said, well, how did you know that this person was Latinx or this person was African-American? And the answer was that at the state of the art at that time was the intake person looked at you <laughs> and decided who you were by, based on your name or what you looked like, okay? Now I'm not that old, okay? But you know, um, <laughs> so it's not been that long that we're saying, wait a minute, I think we can do a little bit better about self-identification and about if we say we're gonna give good healthcare to somebody, then maybe it means that their A1C and their diabetes is under better control, right? But then we have to build that in the system. So we're kind of rehabbing this hundred story sort of structure uh, really with that health equity piece, which is why we need brilliant minds like yours. And it is work that can't be done in a minute uh, because there's always another layer of the onion to like, aha, you know, like as Natalia said, you know, your discharge instructions, can they, can they even read? much less is it plain and clear and in their language, right? Because we know that large segments of our population can make noise, but can't read that language, whether it's English or otherwise. And so how do we address that in terms of really sort of access related issues? And I think the last piece I'll just mention is part of the reason we don't think about some of these things has to do with the invisibility of others' life as compared to ours. Mm. If you were never homeless, if you never knew how not to read, 
if you never went hungry, um, if you were never sort of, you know, if none of these things ever happened to you, how would you imagine, you know, and certainly in terms of medical students I've trained, they're like, well, why don't they just do X, Y, and Z? I'm like, because, you know, the, the, the joke of, you know, you pull himself up by their bootstraps. What if they don't have boots, right? <laughs> you know? Um, and so it's tough because that's not necessarily our lived life. And so it speaks to the importance of sort of that listening and learning and interrogating and reflecting on others. So we'd say, wow, for this person that I just met, what's life like if they did X, Y, and Z, right? Um, there's work in from Princeton researchers that talk about cognitive bandwidth, that when you're stressed, sort of your cognitive bandwidth gets littler. And so if you go in terms of healthcare and they give you really complicated instructions, you're in a bad way because you don't have the bandwidth, not because you're not a smart person, but you know, where you're gonna sleep tonight or where you're gonna get food is like interrupting that steroid wing. You can't sort of understand that. So I think those are, those are the reasons why we're kind of late to the party. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, the historical context is certainly valuable. And then as well as some of these very real examples of what you're trying um, in your systems, the appreciation for it being complicated, multifactorial, the solution isn't a one and done, even though we would like that, that one magic something, right? That, that uh, fairy unicorn that would do everything we want it to do. I will give you an example just very briefly that I read this week in an article uh, from Ottawa. So going back to the early days of the pandemic where they had to find a place to put um, patients that were testing positive for COVID. And this was a particular strategy in Ottawa to reach the homeless. And the idea made by some people in a boardroom somewhere was to convert an unused jail into their COVID hospital. And the nurses and community health workers, most of whom came from the community and had homeless experiences themselves and were working with the homeless, uh, describe in this article how traumatizing it was for most, most of them had had a jailed experience, right? And then um, the solution at that time was obviously to convert it to a hospital. So I share that as an example where we, we have examples of failures too and of very, very um, poor decisions made when you don't have the, uh, the diversity in the room, when you don't have some of the lived experiences in the room helping to make decisions. And I'm not sure, Jose, if you have patients on your board or if you have nurses or frontline healthcare workers on your board per se, but I suspect that you have pathways to hear those voices. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think what helps the most is having people that in anything you do in life, like that you want to be creative, going back to what Dr. Luña said, is basically just hang out with people that are very, very, very different from you. <laughs> and that, and, and new things will come around. So we have a, a finance person that I won't, will, shall remain nameless, that, you know, she will ask you difficult questions in any meeting and they're coming from her perspective. But I think for all of them, because they're, they're really accomplishing what they're doing, they will keep asking you and they don't fear. That, I mean, I don't fear looking like a fool when I'm in those meetings because I'm like, I, I got to a point where I don't care. You know? I want to solve a problem, you know, and, exactly. and I think that's what you get with some of the folks that we have, that they'll just ask questions without that innate fear that we have of looking like fools. As you get older, you care less about that. Uh, and uh, and uh, But what I was going to say, too, is maybe you're not writing a board now, but you are writing a paper. You want to write a good paper or give it or you want to improve your paper give it to somebody to read it that is reasonably intelligent but <laughs> doesn't do the same thing you do yeah. that's the best advice i can give you the best the best health economist that i've one of the best health economists that i've met studied english literature and i was like really and part of the reason why he was able to write so well is because he was just you know he had that type of background. So hang out with people that are very different than you and, and you will become much more creative. I love that. Looking around, just seeing. Carolyn, could I ask a question? 
Um, I feel like we've, a lot of this meeting has been really heavy. So if we could, um, I guess I'm curious, what are some great projects or passion, projects that you're passionate about that you're working on now? Um, just curious for the panelists. Yeah, that's great, Taylor. And I wanted to not ignore Liz's comment in the chat box as well. So certainly let's talk about any of the exciting fun projects that might be happening while they're still in pandemic mode. Um, but then also there was a question of the equity within the healthcare workforce, which I know Natalia, that's a, a challenge that you're, you're tackling head on. Yes, so many projects. I wish I could spin this around so you guys could see behind me. Those are all the projects. <laughs> and there's a huge board outside um, because we have a lot of projects. We're executing a lot. So I, as a leader, I believe in parallel paths. So despite the pandemic, we did not slow down the strategy for nursing um, because I have an amazing team and we were able to um, continue moving our agenda. But we have a lot of exciting things. As I mentioned, we have the great um, partnership with CUNY where we're focusing on um, health equity. Um, our next program will really focus around race um, and race within nursing, racism. Um, and so that will be really interesting. Um, I'm starting fireside chats similar to this with our front line at the system level, um, which starts next month uh, to talk about medication administration. So trying to be visible um, despite uh, the virtual world. Uh, we are doing a lot within nursing quality to improve uh, our ability to benchmark ourselves so that we can uh, move forward towards the journey of nursing excellence. And then uh, towards the end of the year, we're going to have our nurse leader retreat again, as I mentioned, um, which is an annual event that will really focus on professional shared governance for leaders, focusing on accountability, equity, um, ownership, and partnership. Uh, and we will go over the AONL competencies for nurse leaders. Um, so um, for all of you who may not know, it's a professional organization for nurse leaders where we will provide all of our leaders education. Right now, we're doing a lot of exciting work within our nurse education realm. Uh, we are investing $4.2 million over the next five years within nursing education to make sure that our nurses have the best education at the bedside. So we're doing a lot so that they have access to uh, journal articles, um, evidence-based practice, research. We're standing up a research committee, a scientific committee review, just a lot of amazing things happening in nursing. Um, but we're not slowing down because of the pandemic. Uh, we're trying to unfortunately normalize this world uh, but we're going to continue moving to make sure that our nurses have what they need to provide the care that we want, uh, comprehensive, high quality care to our patients. So a lot of great work and exciting things happening. Thanks, Natalia. And I will just look at our time. We have about seven minutes. One more question from Hannah, which will probably wrap us up. But Jose or Anna, do you want to highlight a project that you think is cool or exciting right now? We have a ton of things going on. Um, I sort of came here as collaborator in chief uh, and there's lots of things to, to work in both in terms of anti-racism in research curriculum as well as continuity uh, curriculum for both um, the medical students as well as sort of residents and trainees. So innovation sort of in that space. Um, so there's, there's a number of things in terms of, you know, helping NIH researchers understand how a lab needs to have diverse people in it. Um, and when they're applying for their grants that NIH is actually now finally making a big deal about DEI, um, what that means. And also have some success in terms of some of our investigators really doing a wonderful job highlighting about sort of what that is. Um, developing metrics um, and engaging sort of everybody in terms of all stakeholders. Um, I sort of say, you know, it's, 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 we have top down where we have senior leaders who've done intercultural development inventory surveys uh, and then talk to everybody in terms of both small groups and focus groups to find out sort of what are those priorities. So structural trans transformation is a lot of work, but it's also fun uh, because it's sort of you can help people in terms of innovation. So cool stuff. And I'm sure you have about 10 open positions soon to be filled by people on the screen, perhaps. <laughs> come, come let's play come let's play lots, lots of good stuff to do uh, jose anything you want to add uh, i mean i I'll, I'll just say that uh the last few years two years have been like you know like 10 in my life in terms of learning and and then i see what other people are doing and i think a lot about like how do i how do i come up with a way of 
developing like a leadership program to or some sort of activity that many people know that they need to do certain things, but they don't know how to do them or how to um, execute a plan. And I'm talking about we are a public safety net system, but what about all these other systems that are out there? How do they address uh, equity, uh, diversity, inclusion, all of that? And uh, are there ways, I know they know how to do it, but I know many people are scared making the changes they need to make. So I've been thinking about like, can we come up with a way of like a safe space in which you can communicate those ideas to people at certain, with certain, uh, at certain job titles, it could be at any level to empower them and to say, you know, here's why you are not able to, not, not able to do it, but here's some ideas that will help you become more effective of where you want to go in a safe environment. So I've been thinking about that. Anybody that wants to get into that, more than happy to, to talk about it. Uh, and that's why I wanted to talk to you and, and, and be here because I think that leadership development and interdisciplinary leadership development is very important. And I uh, and, uh, really appreciate the chance to, to have been able to do this, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Jose, your comments make remind me of a, a book called Predictably Irrational, um, which, which I love. It's actually a great book. It talks about sort of humans are irrational, but predictably so. Right. Uh, and maybe maybe your, your leadership thing for those folks is predict predictably irrational, how not to be scared to promote equity. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. maybe that's the title for your session to sort of make them not be scared. <laughs> if, you, if you see that, I'll pay you royalties. If I <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're on, we're on. <laughs> I love that. And it feeds right into what Hannah's last question was in our remaining minutes. Yeah, I was just going to say the perfect segue. Um, do you guys have any favorite podcasts or books that you recommend to us to read or listen to? That can include your favorite music band as well. Um, <laughs> not really into music, but um <laughs> So I think for students, I, I teach at Columbia University. I've taught there for seven years. One of my favorite books for students that I always recommend is The First 90 Days. I give it to I gave it to my sister for Christmas. Um, I it's a great book when you're starting a new job and it really teaches you how to strategize. It's one of the books that's given um, out to students at Harvard. So that's one of my favorite books. I'm currently listening, I just finished two podcasts, The Power of Now and The New Earth by Eric Toll. I think the pandemic, you know, talk about being silent and just understanding what is my purpose. Um, and so most recently I asked my team, what is your purpose? And someone said, Natalia, our purpose is health equity. Um, and um, because that is the national agenda of nursing right now. So to make an impact on the lives of others. And so right now I'm just doing a lot of soul searching again to live my purpose every day, Hannah. Thank you for that question. Um, so, I was I was uh, listening to NPR one day and they were talking about this this guy this guy was talking about the things he was doing in a book that he wrote called Rejection Proof. I don't know if you've heard about it or not, but um, so and it was basically he had a business and he failed and took some time off and started doing all these tests to become rejection proof. Uh, what if I ask you to do something silly and you tell me no? Uh, there's a good example where he takes uh, he goes to a donut shop and asks them to put the donuts in the shape of uh, the Olympic logo in colors. And it gets done. Or he goes to somebody's house and says, can I play soccer, football in your backyard? And, and But there's some of it, he takes it up a step. But the fun part about it is that there's some interesting lessons on that because when people tell you no, he basically talks about how you ask the person why not. And then it opens more conversations. So it was a way of him dealing with rejection in business, in anything you do that is not only amusing, but very, uh, I think, very uh, useful. Thank you. It's great. Anna, any suggestions? No, I like nerding out to Hidden Brain uh, as a podcast just because it's sort of, you know, how people think and sort of frame stuff. Uh, so to me, that's, that's kind of like the, the fun sort of junk food. 
Um, you know, there's there's actually a great book that I recommend. It's Hardball for Women by Pat Heim and Susan Gallant. Um, it's a quick, easy book. And the only thing that I'll mention is that as you read it, you might get angry. I'm like, yes, that happened. And now I know why. Um, but it's useful to sort of understand in terms of the comments about the hierarchy and how it's built and how we behave and things like that um, in terms of sort of that understanding. Um, I think everybody should read Dorothy Roberts' Fatal, Inve uh, Fatal Invention in terms of the myth about sort of race as well as sort of Isabel Wilkerson and sort of the myth of caste. Um, those are sort of useful just to frame because so much is infused in our health world um, that is sort of within this fable of sort of race uh, that the only way we can unbundle it is if we sort of get our head around it in a way that's sort of useful. Um, so yeah, so there's, I, I, there's an actually a, Two, two quick books. I was just on vacation two weeks ago. Um, so I actually read a bunch. Um, and one was actually the Jodi Picoult latest novel, nice twist, kind of fun, might enjoy it. Um, and then the other was called Midnight Library. Um, and the premise was that when you have sort of a traumatic event, maybe you go to this in-between place and on that library is all the books of all the different multiverses that you could sort of go to. And what does it mean? And as we sort of seek to speak, as Natalia said, about what's our purpose and what do we want to sort of be and do? It was a really lovely book, so fun stuff. Thank you, Anna. And I'll follow up to get book titles and podcast titles and get them out to the uh, interns, make them available to all of them. Thank you all for your time tonight, Jose and Natalia and Anna. I know that we are all grateful for your stories, for your candid reflections, uh, your challenge, gentle challenges. I think that the path in front of us and our future generation of leaders is not an easy one, but you're paving the way and I think it will be a bit easier, hopefully. So thank you, have a great night.